Hello, my name is Henrik Andersson. I work here at the Mid-Sweden University in Sundsvall, Sweden. In this video lecture we will be looking into the clean room that we have here at the facilities. Why do we use a clean room? Well, to fabricate these very small electronic components, you need an environment that is really clean and without basically any dust. Therefore we have special facilities with special ventilation, special clothing and special uh, equipment to keep it as clean as possible. So please join us for this demonstration of the clean room. So now we are standing here in the locker room that is before the actual clean room that we have in here. In the locker room you have to change to this type of clean room clothes as you see me wear wearing here. They consist of an overall, of gloves, of special shoe protective uh, boots. All of these clothes are wear because we need a very clean environment in the clean room and they will protect against particles as well as smudges, grease and salt that you have on your skin. The goggles that we wear, the protective glasses are for your protection that works here. So let's go inside the actual clean room now. So, the first thing I want to show you is the silicone wafers that you actually make the components out of. This is the basis for almost all components that are made in Clearroom, such as microprocessors, transistors, uh, CCD arrays and more. In this box I have 10 inch wafers. Here is such an example of such a silicone wafer. As you can see, it is very thin and it consists of very pure silicone. Actually, the purest material that we are manufacturing in the world. Because the smallest contamination will make big problems when you manufacture such components. The next step I will show you is actually the first step in the manufacturing process of components. It will be the photolithography step in which a pattern is transferred onto these silicon wafers. This is the photolithography part of the clean room. This is called also a yellow room. And why is that? Because you have uh, lamps that are more yellow in, uh, in color and that is because we want to avoid the photoresist that we are using to be exposed to higher powered wavelengths such as blue and green. The first step in manufacturing components is to transfer a pattern to these uh, silicon wafers. A component is built up of many different types of layers such as a doping layer and metal layers and so on until you have formed a component in these many steps. So if you want to transfer a pattern, usually we use what is called a photo mask. Here I have an example of a very simple photo mask. As you can see, it consists just of squares. But if I want to transfer this pattern to the silicon wafer, I need a way to do it. And the way to do it is to put the wafer itself in a machine like this where you will position it on this chuck. You will start it, it will start to spin and uh, on that you will drop this uh, photoresist that will form a layer. This layer is then sensitive 
to, to light. And you can then, by placing this mask between the lamp and the wafer with the photoresist on, you can transfer this pattern onto the wafer. So the first step of transferring a pattern from the mask of this type to a wafer is to apply a thin layer of a photosensitive photoresist. And this is done usually by the process of spin coating. Here I position the wafer onto this shack and I start to spin it at a certain speed and then I simply drop on this photoresist onto this. And then we get a very thin layer of this photoresist onto the wafer. So now we will transfer the pattern to this wafer. Then we put it in this machine that is called a mask aligner. And what the mask aligner does is that you put your wafer here on the bottom. Oops. You put the, the photo mask here on top. And then a very bright UV light will be projected through the photo mask down onto the wafer. And at the positions where we have this chrome coating on the photo mask, the light cannot uh, interact with the photoresist, only where we have the openings. And then it depends on if you have positive or negative photoresist. If you have positive photoresist, it will harden with the UV light. If you have negative photoresist, it will instead be softened by the UV light. And uh, this can then be washed away after we de develop it. So, this machine is a called a sputter. With this, you can sputter material such as gold and other metals, but the technique here is a little different. So you position your stub straight down in this high vacuum chamber. You also have the metal, it will be situated on top, a short way away from your wafer. Uh, in this case, you will have a plasma that will basically hit the metal you want to deposit and the atoms will uh, then go down and uh, form a film on your wafer. The difference with the evaporation method is that you can have even, even better control of your thickness and layer. Also, you can deposit over a smaller area using, for example, gold as a metal. So also this is a very common method to deposit metals and in this case they are also used for contact such as backside contact, source and drain contacts, gate contacts and so on. We are now in the part of the clean room that contains the diffusion ovens. The diffusion ovens are used to dope the silicon material. In this case we use boron for p-doping and we use phosphorus for n-doping. And as you may have heard from my previous lecture or that you have read yourself before, by doping silicon you can alter its uh, characteristics. So let us look closer on the boron doping oven here. So here we see the boron diffusion oven opening. And what you see here is that this part is made of very pure quartz material. You can see that the wafer stands here and behind it you see these white discs. These white discs are made of boron oxide. And when you position silicon wafers very close to and between these boron oxide discs and heat it up, the boron from these discs will diffuse and uh, position themselves onto the silicon wafer. Then they will start to diffuse into the silicon wafer 
and form a thin layer of doped uh, material in the surface. And in this way, you can P-dope silicon wafers. If you want to N-dope it, you can have another material than boron. And in this case, we have phosphorus, and it works in the same way. So here we have the oxidation oven. In this oven, you will put the silicon wafers. You heat it up to around 1000 degrees. And in this process, you can form a very controlled thickness of silicon dioxide. This is a very important step in silicon component processing. In many cases, it was used as a gate oxide in metal oxide semiconductor transistors. Nowadays, there are different alternatives to make these gate oxides. As an alternative to the diffusion ovens that we saw just over there for doping, here we have a machine that is called uh, ion implanter. The machine is controlled from this side where you insert the wafers here and they are transported inside the machine. So let us go uh, on the back side and have a look at what happens there. So this is the back side of the ion implanter. And as you can see here, we use different types of gases such as arsine, that is arsenic gas, and phosphine. What happens here is that you have the gas and you ionize it. Then the ions are selected by being uh, accelerated and forced through a bend in the machine. And uh, they are then separated depending on their mass. The two heavy elements that are not the right element will be forced out in the bend and will not follow the bend. The two light instead elements are then accelerated too narrow and are also selected away. So in this way you can select exactly the right type of ion that you want. These ions are then accelerated and are hit directly onto the wafer and depending on the energy that you put on them they will be implanted at a certain depth in the wafer. Thereby you can create a very defined doping profile in your wafer. Ion implantation is a very good method to use to create very controlled doping profiles in, in silicon wafers. Here we have a few instruments that is used to control parameters uh, of the components that we manufacture in the clean room. First, we have four point probe resistivity measurement equipment here and also here. In this, you can measure the sheet resistance or resistivity of your wafer. Why is four point? Well, in this case, you use the four point method where two of the probe points source the current and two probes measure the voltage drop. In this case, you can get rid of the contact resistance that you usually have when you measure with a regular two-point measurement method. To get the sheet resistance, you just position the wafer under here. You press down this probe on top of it, and you can get the result here. The sheet resistance, as you may know, is the resistance per, per area. It does not take into account the thickness of the material. In that case, you want to calculate the resistivity. And that, for that, you need to know the thickness of your material and also that it is homogeneous. Usually when we talk about doping profiles, you are more concerned about the sheet resistance. With this machine, you can measure the thickness of the silicon dioxide, the silicon oxide. You position the wafer on this jig here. You put it beneath here. You look into this microscope and then you can match this thickness to a thickness that is already on this uh, standards that you put in here. In this way, you can determine quite easily the thickness of the silicon dioxide. And here we have a very good, uh, very precise scale that you can measure very, very small units of weight with. And this is some of the equipment 
that we use to check the production in the clean room. So this equipment is what we call a plasma edge. In this you can do very good etching in silicon wafers and also other material like metals and so on. And what you can do because it's a plasma edge, you can do very very precise defined etchings down into the substrate without having what we call under etch that is very common when you do chemical etching, meaning that in this case it etched both down and at the same time out. So you get a very uh, deformed etching hole. With this one you can basically drill holes with etching straight down in the wafer. A lot of the processing steps involved in doing components is different types of etchings. Here we have an example of what we call a wet bench, where it can work with acids and other solutions. A very common solution here is the HF or hydrochloric fluoride solution that is commonly used to etch away the silicon dioxide from the wafers. Both it can be done to first to clean the wafer from the native oxide that is always present on wafers that you store in a room climate. Second, when you have done a deposition of, a, for example, a gate oxide, you want often to etch it away from certain parts of the wafer, and then you use HF solution. Another very common thing you do, you want to etch the metal, such as aluminum, titanium and so on. And for that we have certain metal etches. It is very important that, that you do not mix acids with uh, other types of chemicals. So that's why we have special benches for this. We have now seen the whole clean room and the different processes that are used to make components here. If you consider the difference between this and printed electronics, you will see that it's a big difference in the complexity of the equipment. In other video presentations that we will show, we will instead show how you can print and use printing technology to manufacture components. <laughs>